Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Melanie Kress, and I am the Associate Curator for Highline Art, the public art program presented by the Highline in New York City. I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining us for the first conversation in the symposium, Remote Control, Surveying Drones and Culture Today, titled Soundscapes of Conflict. We had originally hoped for this conversation to take place alongside a brief performance of Guillermo Galindo's Remote Control, a work originally commissioned by Kronos Quartet and their 50 for the Future series in person with our partners at the Clemente. As with so many events still, we are now online and so honored all the same to be joined by Guillermo and fellow artist and composer Raven Chacon. Um, please do stay tuned uh, for the rescheduled performance later on this year on the Highline. This symposium is co-organized co by the Highline, Virla Center for Art and Politics at the New School, and writer and researcher Arthur Holland Michelle. The symposium is convened in the context of artist Sam Durant's Highline Plinth Commission Untitled Drone and the Vera List Center's As for Protocols focused theme. Sam's Untitled Drone is a large scale art commission that intends to increase visibility around intentionally obscured drone warfare and surveillance perpetuated by the United States. Currently on view on the Highline at 30th Street through August of this year, the work continues Highline Art's mission of presenting new, powerful, thought prevent provoking artworks that generate and amplify some of today's most important conversations. Inspired by this artwork and the As For Protocols theme, this symposium brings together leading experts, artists, activists, academics, and practitioners across diverse disciplines to examine contemporary intersections of drones and drone warfare, arts and culture, to demystify the twin histories of surveillance and drone warfare. As we begin, I have a few announcements regarding the logistics of the event. These will also be included in the chat. Throughout the presentation and discussion, we invite you to ask questions. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will select from your questions for our moderator. If you would like to use the closed captioning, please go to the bottom of your Zoom screen and click the CC option. Here you will be able to turn on the captions. If you have any technical questions, you can drop them in the Q&A. Lastly, in the coming days after the series, a recording of this event will be posted on the Highlands and the Verilis Center's websites for future viewing. Although we are in virtual space together, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that I come to you today from Manhattan, New York, on the ancestral land of the Muncie Lenape. If you are interested in finding out the name of the indigenous people whose land you live on, please visit the link in the chat. I would like to now introduce our event moderator, Christoph Cox. Christoph is a philosopher, critic, and curator of visual and sonic art. He is Professor of Philosophy, Dean of the Faculty, and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Hampshire College, where he teaches modern and contemporary philosophy and art theory. Christoph is a member of the Graduate Committee at the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College. Christoph, thank you for being here, and please join us, as well as Avon and, uh, Raven and Guillermo. Thanks very much, Melanie, um, and thanks to Highline Art and the Verilist Center for Art and Politics for inviting us to this discussion around sonic politics and surveillance. Before we just uh, start that discussion, I want first to introduce my collaborators for this evening. Um, so um, Guillermo and Raven, if you could join us. Guillermo Galindo is an experimental composer, sonic architect, performance artist, and visual media artist. Galindo's work redefines the conventional limits between music, the art of music composition, and the intersections between art disciplines, politics, humanitarian issues, spirituality, and social awareness. Raven Chacon is a composer, performer, and installation artist from Fort Defiance, Navajo Nation. As a solo artist, collaborator, or with post-commodity, Chacon has exhibited or performed at the Whitney Biennial, Documenta 14, Red Cat, the Contemporary Art Museum Montreal, San Francisco Electronic Musical uh, Music Festival, Chaco Canyon, End Times Festival, the 18th Biennial of Sydney, the Kennedy Center, and other venues. Every year, he teaches 20 students to write string quartets for the Native American Composer Apprenticeship Project. So please join me in welcoming uh, these fantastic artists to our conversation. So as Melanie mentioned, our discussion this evening is organized around Sam Durant's Highline Commission, Untitled Drone, which if you haven't seen it, it's a large scale fiberglass version of a Predator drone that sits atop a 25 foot pole on the Highline. Discussions of drone technology and drone warfare often focus on the drone as a vision machine, as a, as a machine for visual surveillance and attack. So for example, we see this in the title of Arthur Holland Michel's book, 
um, eyes in the sky, which describes the drone as an all seeing eye. And of course, etymologically, the term surveillance means just that, to oversee or to watch over. If we think about it this way, we think from the perspective of surveillance itself. But if we think about it from the other side, that is from the position of the surveilled, surveillance is largely invisible, or at least it wants or, or attempts to be. Huge drones, tier three drones like the Predator can hover nearly five miles above their intended targets. And so they're almost entirely invisible to those below. To counter this invisibility, Durant has said that one of his, the key aims of his piece is to bring drones into visibility. But the discourse and experience of the drone is not just about vision and visibility. We know that the word drone has a couple of meanings, right? Which we often, which at least we mus musical types go back and forth about, right? A drone can be a male honeybee who does no work, um, uh, but who can fertilize the queen, or it can be a continuous humming sound or a musical pitch, or of course, of course, in the topic of our discussion today, a remote controlled pilotless aircraft. And there's an interesting etymological connection among these three senses, because the term drone comes from a set of Middle English and Proto-Indo-European roots that refer to sound, refer to the sound of the bee, to hum, to buzz, to roar, to boom. Um, now, artists such as Harun Faroqi and Omar Fast have explored the visual context of aerial and drone warfare. Um, I'm very happy today to be talking with two artists whose interest lies in music and sound, in the sonic experience of surveillance, and in sound as a tool to counter the effects of military and police surveillance. So uh, to begin with a question, one of the things that strikes me about your work, Guillermo and Raven, is that you're often interested in employing surveillance technologies and tactics against themselves. We see this, for example, in Guillermo's composition, Remote Control, that, that Melanie mentioned a moment ago, um, and that we hope will be performed later on in the year. Guillermo, I'm wondering whether you could describe that piece, and then we could use it to, to begin our conversation about kind of surveillance and counter surveillance. Yes, this is a string quartet, and um, it's kind of decentralized, uh, the same way uh, our virtual instruments are decentralized. And it's, uh, it, it emphasizes the detachment between uh, personal uh, war or the, 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 the impressions of war in a, in a 3D uh, encounter with a person that is attacked. And uh, the way that uh, virtual reality has separated us from from the actual uh, um, moment of attack and from the ultra 3D reality of the people that is being attacked with the drones. So it's this separation that happens uh, with all of our technology and all of our um, instruments, even musical instruments, detachment from, from a direct, um, direct confrontation with reality. Yeah, so what in that piece, at least the video portions of the piece mix a bunch of different kinds of sounds, including the, I mean, the, um, they mix, for example, the um, uh, sounds of, you know, cockpit sounds from, uh, or, or the, the sounds of, 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 um, of sort of drone surveillance, as well as other sounds, right? The sounds from, from, um, from, from refugee camps, right? Is, is, is yes, that that's correct. I, I have a, at the end, I have a, I, there's this quartet by Stockhausen that it's a, a quartet with four helicopters. And I'm kind of a, a they are always counting, uh, down counting in German to create anxiety. And what I did is I had uh, the people of the refugee camps in Germany, um, the children counting in Pashtun and in their own languages, kind of a comment on, uh, on Stockhausen Quartet. Yeah, so uh, Stockhausen's Quartet, I think, was was um, was early on. Kind of both people are intrigued by this and criticized it for sort of using sort of military technology in an exactly. aesthetic um, context. And your piece kind of does the same thing, but to but to sort of turn it on its head a little bit. Um, Raven, your your um, the, the post commodities piece also employs these count, the counter strategies. I'm thinking of the piece, uh, the ears between worlds are always speaking, which was presented at Documenta. 
Um, could you describe that piece a little bit and the use of, of those, um, uh, the, the LRADs? Yeah, yeah. At the time, uh, us in the collective, we were experimenting with hyperdirectional sound. So at first working with these kind of more commercial units, you know, things you might see in exhibition spaces to isolate sound or direct sound. Um, but also that technology is still very much, um, you know, it's very rudimentary and lo-fi. I mean, it doesn't really reproduce uh, low frequencies or anything like that. And, uh, you know, our dream was to get a hold of the, the big one, which is the, the LRADs, the long range acoustic devices, which of course are this ominous device that was used at the G20 summit. We were hearing reports of them being used on, the, you know, protesters, even at Guantanamo. And we thought, you know, that was a dream. We thought they would be hard to come by, but actually we were able to, you just buy them. They, the, we, we wrote the LRAD corporation and they said, yeah, they're about $20,000. And we said, well, we don't have that money. And we found one on eBay. Turned out that the, you know, one of these police departments here in the Midwest had one that they had bought with their Homeland Security money and that, uh, you know, the terrorists never came. So they had this thing <laughs> they wanted to liquidate and we got ours on a deal. And so we, we wanted to use this as a music, again, as a musical instrument. And what we wanted to do is instead of using it as this kind of punishing, you know, instrument to use it as a carrier of message, to use it in its inverse, you know, to, to direct stories to a group, but also to individuals, you know, speaking one-to-one -one, if, if that were to be possible. And so what the piece at Documenta was, was this, uh, I guess this loosely described opera, this narrative of having a uh, accumulation of narratives of folks who were uh, refugees coming from Afghanistan and Syria across the Mediterranean to arrive in Athens. Meanwhile, you had, we had narratives uh, from folks coming across the borderlands where I live and where Post Commodity was based you know, traversing the deserts of New Mexico and Arizona and Sonora to arrive in a similar situation, to arrive at a better place. And some of these were narratives that we gathered, um, you know, all by recording, whether their actual voices ended up through the LRAD or it was gone through the filter of a musician who was living in Athens to tell this story. Likewise, there were also older stories from the Navajo Long Walk and the Cherokee Trail of Tears when the federal government tried to kill, you know, our people. And all of this ending up in this day-long uh, uh, audio piece that would tell these stories of forced migration and movement across the land. And as one walked through Aristotle's Lyceum, they were able to experience this. They are walking through Aristotle's Lyceum and they're hearing stories about walking as well. And um, I, re I recall you saying that, that uh, if not the, the, the first time you dealt with LRADs, but, but um, uh, st at Standing Rock, right? These were used as, 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 as dispersal tactics by, um, uh, by the authorities, right? And so this was, was and I, I remember you describing some experiences with the LRADs there and wanting to kind of reverse reverse their or turn them in the other direction or something or or turn them to a a kind of um a, a, a gentler humanitarian purpose um is that is that right absolutely um you know i went to standing rock in the fall of 2016 uh, you know I, I, first and foremost to to just be a presence there to be a witness as to what was happening and um but at the same time, I was hearing that there were these sonic weapons and other kinds of weapons that were being, uh, you know, used against the water protectors. So a bit of it was to do that research to see what would happen. I was figuring if, um, you know, this was before we had an LRAD, see what, what is the effect when they are used maliciously onto the public. And fortunately, while I was there, I didn't in, uh, encounter that. But uh, there is a famous photo that I'll put here in the chat uh, and maybe they could repost that uh, is a, of an LRAD in use at Standing Rock. And of course they get justified by the authorities, by the police and the private security as saying, 
well, we, we are using this as a long range messaging device, you know, or even warning device. But of course, it has the capability of deafening anybody in its beam and, uh, and is used to, to torture. And so, yeah, that was, that was um, another instance where you started seeing these kinds of things come out, you know, and, and, and it's true, you know, you, you don't always see that beam. It's not like, like when they were blasting water at the water protectors, you know, the irony of that to, to, to use that back on, on uh, the native people and the allies, but, um, but this kind of unseen uh, menace that, that, later on, as you see in this photo, they were using it, beaming it directly at the camps. They were using it in the nighttime to keep people awake. Uh, and they were, they were, um, uh, one report that I heard was that the, in that cold sub-zero temperature there in North Dakota in January, it actually emitted heat. Sound was producing heat onto these, these people, um, which, which maybe in itself was a warning saying, we have technology, you know, that you don't know about. Interesting. Um, so that I, I, I know that you think of that piece very much as taking a, a piece of, of military technology in a way and, and employing it for a kind of aesthetic use. Guillermo, in, in, in remote control, um, is there any concern that, that you know, you're, you're employing these you know, I'm thinking of the cockpit audio that that shows up in those in those in those video pieces that um, that uh, audience members use. Is there a concern that there's a kind of that, that there's an aesthetification? Aesthetification is that the right word? Aesthetic, yeah. Of 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 kind of um, of a kind of military sound or or let me put it a different way maybe what do you ex what what do you want from your audience or or um you know what's the experience you want for for them to to have with that audio um uh both from the string quartet and from the and from the vi and from the video pieces what kind of experience are you looking for well i'm 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 uh being involved with the translation of data and uh the 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 reconfiguration, uh, similar to what Raven is doing, the reconfiguration of data to turn it on itself. Mm -hmm. And I, I, when you hear these four uh, video and audio um, um, pieces, you're not hearing directly uh, what they are about. You're hearing noise, and it's more turning to noise and into a, a gerbil, you know, of, of an ambience that it's similar to what you hear uh, before a drone attack. Mm -hmm. It's this kind of a menacing advice to like, like something is going to happen. And it's been these kind of things. Uh, I, I've been reading a lot about like the, the sound bombs used in uh, by the Israeli army. And uh, also uh, from my uh, border cantos work, I did a lot of translation of uh, data uh, into into music or into um, uh, music uh, notation. That's what I like. I like a lot of the translation of one thing to another and reappropriation, probably appropriation of some kind of data to create an aesthetic or to create um, uh, a feeling or yeah. a mood. Um, I want to I want to return to the border cantos later and, and to talk about um, to talk about some of both of your work on the border. Um, Raven, if I'm right, well, I, I know that if, if we don't always see drones, right, we've become even even those of us who who are who experience the kind of uh, low tier drones that people use all the time, you know, at, at sporting events and whatever, we're, we're, we become attuned to that sound, that very, that, that kind of very strange buzzing sound. Um, and sometimes at least we hear it before we see it, right? We hear that thing and then we look around, we look for it. Um, uh, I know that you have employed that sound in, in some works, right? You've employed the, the sound. Can you, can you describe some of how you've used that kind of drone sound in, in some of your works? Yeah, yeah. Back back to that fall of 2016, I was um, I had this field recorder in my pocket while I was there at Standing Rock, and um, which was very hard to you know I had to take a ton of batteries because the batteries would drain in that temperature. But 
I tried to record as much as I could and, um, you know, also be careful not to be seen as an undercover cop or anything like that either. I was simply capturing, I don't even, maybe I shouldn't say capturing. I was w- wanting a second set of ears to, to document what was happening around me, you know, as we were hearing these sounds that I'd never heard before, the, you know, the, the megaphone of the police, you know, saying, leave this native land to, to people who have stewarded that place. You know, again, this kind of um, this dissonance of hearing that against, let's say, uh, a lot of different tribes and nations singing throughout the night. The, the contrast of that, I wanted to, cap, you know, capture that. And I, and I wanted to remember that and years later reflect on that. And so I, over the span of the week and a half that I was there, I have hours and hours of recordings. And inside of these recordings, there would be instances of silence. There would be moments of rest, of prayer, of even silent protest. And then you would hear this buzz in there, it's kind of spinning. And so I grabbed all of those little snippets when I would hear that, you know, if I could isolate one of those. And these were drones. These were, not only were they the DAPL security or the North Dakota, uh, what I'm imagining is the North Dakota Police Department's drones, they were also counter drones, water protector drones used back to see where the police were encroaching into Standing Rock, you know, to see what was uh, where they were, who, who was wandering around, you know, the outside and, and just a way to have eyes back, uh, you know, in, in, in counter to, to what they were doing. And the police would actually shoot down these counter drones. I remember hearing, uh, speaking to, uh, a young man there, water protector. I think he's also from Diné nation had a drone and he was using it early on in, in the water protection to uh, surveil back to the authorities. And they shot his drone down. Well, he put that, captured that event on uh, Instagram and put out a plea saying, you know, I need some funds to order some new parts to fix my drone. And at the Standing Rock Post Office, 20 more drones arrived. And so there became this fleet of water protector drones that were able to counter surveil. And that's something that, um, you know, is, is, is kind of a more contemporary phenomenon to be able to do that and, and, uh, and have the, that allyship beyond in the world. So anyway, using these drones, I wanted to have this uh, a bit like, like Guillermo, as I hear Guillermo talk, this, um, this buzzing, you know, this movement of drones. And, and you don't know where it's coming from in a way, maybe that's a group listening, but it's also very solitary listening of saying, is this thing above me? Is it, where is it? I, I can't follow it. And uh, so I had made this piece called Storm Pattern. It's actually a score that replicates different possibilities of movement of eight drones and using eight samples from my field recordings put this into an installation environment with hyperdirectional speakers. And um, the name Storm Pattern comes after how I modeled the score after this uh, tradition of Navajo weaving uh, rugs called the Storm Pattern, where it kind of emanates from a center field. The strangest thing about these uh, snippets of drone recordings is they all seem to be A440 which is how we, how we tune our instruments. You know, I don't know if that's just the speed of the motor that the motor needs to achieve its uh, maximal, uh, you know, uh, liftoff or whatever, but uh, they all seem to be somewhere around A440, which I thought was, was a, a funny way to think about, you know, as we, as we are kind of stuck in a equal, te- equal temperament Western idea of music. Again, that, that brings back all those three senses of drones, right? Drone as the steady tone, drone as the, the yeah. Um, that, that's, that's super fascinating. And I, I really look forward to seeing that or, or hearing that storm pattern work at some point, which I remember, I think that was up recently in Berlin, right? Um, at the, at the um, Haus der Kultur in der Welt. Yeah. Um, 
I want to turn a little bit toward the question of embodiment and disembodiment. I know, um, Guillermo, one of the things that interests you in, in remote control is just the kind of video gamification of war, right? The, the, the ways in which, I mean, that uh, drone pilots, and they literally describe themselves often. Um, I, I'm thinking, for example, those of you who know Omar Fast's uh, uh, film, 5,000 Feet is the Best, and I guess um, Melanie will be having discussion with, with Omar Fast later on this week, but it's a, it's a, it's a fictional, quasi-fictional um, uh, film that is an interview with a drone pilot and there's a fictional drone pilot and a real drone pilot. But one of the things that the, the drone pilot says, the, the real drone pilot is that they, they think of their work like video games, right? They're, they're at these controllers say in Las Vegas, but they're hovering over Afghanistan. They're, you know, they're controlling this thing and this drone in Afghanistan. And one of the most terrifying things that the, the, uh, the, the real drone pilot says is, you know, often we, we go home and we play video games for four hours just to calm down, just to just to chill out a little bit, which is, you know, kind of startling. But um, um, Guillermo, maybe you could talk a little bit about your interest in that kind of the weirdly disembodied experience um, of of uh, of the drone and of warfare today and and how you wanted to kind of employ that in your um, in that piece in remote control. Yes, reading uh, from uh, Steve Goodman's Sonic Warfare, I, I, I noticed that um, the what we call the UAV, the unmanned aircraft vehicles, mm -hmm. uh, is not really that there's no people, there's about 200 people in charge of the whole operation. And there's a, a, a it's, it's very interesting because the people that the person that is driving the drone is in absolute silence, just seeing things. And the people that is experiencing the drone is actually hearing something. Is hearing the sound of the drone. That is kind of a, is kind of an announcement of death. And um, what I'm concerned about is the the the, the way that um, technology that came from the military is being transformed now into the video games, and the video games go back to the military, and it's a back and forth that it's uh, um, the humanization of violence and detachment of, uh, of uh, real things that are happening in the 3D dimension. If we go to the, to the very early kinds of war, there was confrontation face to face and how we've been detaching from it and detaching from, um, from the reality of war. They, uh, the, the driver of the, of the drone doesn't even know how many people is killing or how many people are there in the zone uh, because the, the, the way that this person is looking at the screen is just a, a, a little bird's eye of the whole thing. They cannot even perceive the space. It's, a, it's kind of a video feed of the whole thing. So I'm very, I'm, uh, that's what concerns me, particularly in, um, in remote control, the detachment from, from reality and the detachment from violence and the detachment from everything that we're having now, even from personal relations with one another, uh, which is exactly coming back to the Native American view of things, no? Which is the attachment to things that are around you and the environment and your things around you. I mean, if you detach from that, you become nothing. I mean, the hum uh, us being human is about being attached to everything that surrounds us in a 3D reality. Yeah, and of course, the the irony there is that we were all supposed to be in person tonight. Um, we were hoping to be in person tonight. <laughs> and this is another one, yeah. <laughs> and experiencing your piece um, live, which um, hopefully we'll get it, we'll get the chance to do that. Um, our, our Zoom worlds has become a bit like drone piloting as well. Um, but do you see Guillermo? Do you see your work uh, not just in remote control uh, um, and elsewhere? Your work with sound, with live musicians with real physical objects, for example, as, as, as that effort to kind of reclaim that, that embodiment and that, that sense of, of, of reality, as you put it. Yeah. I'm, I'm literally turning the piece into a community event, right? Which is the way that art is seen in most of other cultures. No, it's a community event. Art is not something that is outside of our lives. Art is a community event. 
Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And, and it's very interesting because it's the contrast between these and making it community based. Yeah. So it's turning into itself very similar to what Raven was talking about when the, the rat speakers and all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, I wondered whether we could turn to talking about borders and, and sonic politics. Each, each of you has in, in many ways, in, in different ways, not always sonically, but um, turned to, to thinking about borders and migration. I find this really fascinating in, in my own work on sonic politics. I'm really interested in the border as really the way to think about sound because fundamentally politics, right? We use that term a lot, politics. Um, we, we sort of academics and artists and, and in its base, politics is about the polis and it's about separating who's in and who's out, right? And often that goes by way of sound in the sense that you speak like us, you don't speak like us. You speak our language, you don't speak our language, right? Can you pass through? Do you have the right papers? That kind of thing. Um, so I'm really interested in your work um, uh, on, on politics and, and at, at the border. Um, I know, Raven, you've done several projects um, with Post Commodity. I'm thinking in particular of, of Repellent Fence, but then I want to turn to some other works. But could you describe Repellent Fence a little bit? Yeah, Repellent Fence was, I mean, that was the biggest work the collective had done. And it was... Uh, a series of 26 balloons that uh, it bisected the U.S.-Mexico border in this four days of reimagined ceremony, as the collective calls it. Um, this opportunity of countering that line while also uh, tracing migration routes that had been there before, of course, that encroachment of the border, the border wall. And this, of course, was all pre, uh, pre-Trump pre as well, this installation going up. So this, this has been an ongoing uh, discussion before that, that, you know, hadn't even really reached the broader public, you know, and, and, until, uh, you know, some of Trump's discourse around that. But, um, but it was only a four-day event, and it was an opportunity for people who lived on both sides of that border community, Douglas, Arizona, and Agua Prieta, uh, Douglas, Arizona, uh, Agua Prieta, Sonora, to have this exchange, to have this opportunity of memory and really use it around an event to, to try to exchange as much as they could, despite that, that barrier. Um, but when we were down there, we ended up making some other works. We made a work that looked at the architecture of the border fence, the different iterations of, of how it is um, even in conflict with itself, it contradicts itself. Some areas, you know, you have about 500 feet of very impassable uh, metal tall slats. And then, you know, after that, you have a very porous, uh, these kind of anti-vehicle jacks, you know, but allows deer to run through. And you go a little bit further and it's just a barbed wire fence, you know, so there's no rhyme or reason really to, to what exists there other than maybe optics. There's another piece we ended up making, and, and this, this was a piece called Coyotaje. This was a piece that we had kind of fallen into our laps in some way because we had to deal with the Border Patrol so much. We were, we were talking to the Border Patrol, uh, trying to, you know, uh, we realized later we didn't actually need their permission to do this piece, but we had so, had so many conversations with them. They told us a lot. One of these things is, is, is the sonic... Uh, this kind of sonic thing that came up that was, they shared with us that there was, um, there'd be times when they would go and be out in the desert and say, um, you know, start speaking in Spanish, ayuda, or, uh, you know, help me, or who's there, you know, or even call out names, you know, Juan, you know, in, in, in trying to trick people who are hiding, into coming out and exposing themselves. So you have a lot of uh, Spanish speakers who work for the Border Patrol who are looking at it a bit like a game, like this kind of trickery. So we were talking about the coyote, you know, this, this uh, animal that is in all of our creation stories and likes to trick the world and how the Border Patrol were using that as a sonic tactic with language and, you know, slang and all of this kind of... Um, 
familiarity because they come from those same communities. And so that troubled us. That was like, <laughs> this is bad uh, uh, to use the sound, to use the words, to use the names back on the people. Yeah, and I, as I understand, Repellent Fence was um, was this was this visual event in a way, but right, it was it was a kind of a it was sort of a social practice work. The aim of which was like to get to engage in these conversations, kind of cross border conversations. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a that was a large effect as we were making the the piece. You know, we wanted it to be this intervention, but we realized it was becoming much more. Right. In the early stages of us envisioning this, this intervention, of course, it, we were using this commercial bird repellent product as our, as our uh, thing that we were amplifying, that we were making bigger. You know, and, and this is supposed to be these eyes that scare away birds. But we, were think, we started seeing the similarities in that of these towers of cameras that are also on the border. You know, the, 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 the flying them at the same height, and they also have these four cameras, these four eyes that would look over, look over that space. And we would see these towers as we were installing, and they were always menacing. You know, even to be there on the border and knowing the border patrol was sitting up on a hill with binoculars mm -hmm. staring at us. In the four years or so we were down on the border, often working on this, you just feel those eyes on you. Mm -hmm. However, in the four days of the repellent fence uh, uh, ceremony, we realized, we, hey, we have free security, actually. You know, if anybody was going to come <laughs> shoot down our balloons or, uh, you know, if any of our audience uh, dehydrated out there in the desert or got bit by a rattlesnake, well, we know the Border Patrol's watching. So it actually flipped. One day we were like, hey, you know, we're safe out here, you know, and um you know, we were we we were worried about things like the, the cartel and the um, kind of uh, white supremacist nationalist uh, Minutemen characters that are down there. So we had this we had this funny flip that where surveillance again was on our side in a in a strange way. Interesting, yeah, um, Guillermo. Um, I wonder whether you could talk a little bit about your Border Kentos project as a project, as a visual project and a, a kind of a sculptural project, but also a sonic project, a project that you did with um, with the photographer Richard Misrock. So um, could you say a little bit about that and how, and how that engages these, the kind of this border conversation? Yes, I started working with uh, Richard when I was already uh, building what I call my um, border sonic devices. And my sonic border, the uh, border sonic devices are based on the on the pre-Columbian concepts of um, of um, the instrument or the musical instrument, not as a as an instrument of aesthetic beauty, but as a healer instrument or a connection or a talisman in connection to other worlds, and uh, how things that surround us are so. Uh, close to us that can kill, cure us or heal us. So um, I was making these instruments in order to heal or to connect into the imaginary stories of the border crossers. If you see, uh, uh, when I joined uh, Richard Misrach, photographer, he was already taking photographs and it was surprising how his photographs don't include actually the people that is crossing the border, but the landscape. So. Um, we ended up at some point, uh, the, the exhibit uh, became really big and it has traveled all over the United States. It became a book and uh, we end up uh, calling it the, the presence of absence, which is a, a very important thing. No, the narrative doesn't come directly from the photographs or from the sounds of my uh, musical devices or sound devices, but it comes from the imaginary stories that the viewer or the listener creates in their minds of what happened there. It's kind of a, it's something in between a dreamlike situation and a forensic site where you find uh, the evidence of a crime or a bit evidence that something that happened and you have to imagine with the sounds and the visuals what actually happened there. It's a, it's a very extensive project. It includes a lot of things too. It includes uh, scores uh, that I uh, developed from the 
musical language of the late 20th century, which I studied uh, with Stockhausen, uh, um, Cage, and uh, Cornelius Cardew, and all of these um, uh, composers that use uh, graphic musical language as alternative. And uh, my interest in translating uh, data uh, from uh, humanitarian organizations that hold, uh, that find bodies in the border and that uh, define the characteristics of the body that was found, where it was found, the possible cause of death, and translating that into actual different uh, types of data and making it into graphic scores, which is, uh, is, is a metaphor for what is a human life, what is the value of a human life, and what is data of a human, lost human life translated into into something abstract completely or into sound or into something else. So it's basically a project on translation in my own side. Right. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I mentioned early on, like if politics is about borders and about the separation, right, the kinds of translation is a way of, 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 of crossing those borders. Yeah. Um, Melody reminds me that, that there is a, there's a work from Border Cantos on view at the High Line through March um, called uh, uh, Fuente, um, Fuente de uh, Lagrimas, a fountain of tears. Um, that's that's a fountain made from water stations that volunteers have um, left near the U.S.-Mexico border um, to serve those attempting the crossing. So that that piece is interesting and one that one could see in 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 New York. Um, I. Another kind of interesting border piece, or at least I think of it that way, is a, is a piece, um, Raven, that you and Post Commodity did at, um, I think also at Documenta, I'm thinking of the, uh, um, the, the, the Pink Noise piece. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting that uh, border, what's, Blind Curtain. Oh, Blind Curtain, yeah. Yeah. Can, yeah, can you say a little bit about that? That's an interesting piece too that uses, that, that really thinks about a sonic border. So in, in working uh, years ago in, for my own research for looking at these hyperdirectional speakers, I was also looking at pink noise as this uh, masking uh, sonic effect. And um, it's, it's, I mean, it's been used for a long time as a sleep aid. You remember these kind of waterfalls or rainforest sound devices you used to put by your bed. And uh, now there's apps for that kind of thing. And somewhere in there, we were also hearing this, this um, maybe this report or this rumor that uh, politicians, officials, maybe even they were saying Hillary Clinton was beaming pink noise in, a, in their hotel room to have conversations so that this would mask any kind of bugging or even any kind of eavesdropping in the adjacent rooms. Um, so... Thinking of that and combining that with the hyperdirectional research, Post Commodity made this curtain. And this was a very subtle piece that was a document. And in fact, a lot of people maybe didn't even realize it was there, but we wanted to make this threshold, this, this kind of unseen invisible curtain um, that would act as a barrier or at least an acknowledgement of, of the difference between the outside of the museum and the inside of the museum. You know this this idea of maybe accessibility also, where um, or this unspoken accessibility, where one might not even feel they can go in to see Documenta, one of the venues of Documenta. That's just not where they're ever allowed into. You know this this mm -hmm. space, and so yeah, just making these kind of these kind of borders. You know, and, and maybe still thinking about these other um, these spaces you know, and what these spaces hold inside of them and, and what that might mean to people who want to experience the work that's inside of Documenta. At the same time, the piece was not completely a critique. I think we also thought of it as a, a bit of a welcome, like that there is a threshold and we're inviting you to pass through it, you know, to, to go to the other side of that. Cool. Um, want to remind folks that it, that if you if uh, the the folks attending that if you want to put a question in the Q and A, feel free to do so. Um, uh, here's one. Um, uh, some uh, an attendee asks, "Can you talk about art as a community event and embodiment?" Um, I guess this is for either Raven or or Guillermo. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I, I think a lot of post commodities work has started becoming these social practice pieces, and that's where maybe a a type of uh, format or genre we found ourselves in. But I think Guillermo and I could tell you very much that being a musician and composer has always been this kind of community uh, project. You know, we we have to work with others. We have to gather people that maybe we don't we don't know so well because we come under the same umbrella and, and interests and love of music. And so it's it's that that model of collaboration is there from day one in the work that we do. We're, it's it's very natural and and can only exist with you know because of other people, large ensembles, small ensembles, becoming familiar with the skill sets of others. Um, is is a big part of that and by extension then you have those audiences you have those other participants who are who come with those those musicians i think that's that's something that Guillermo and i have talked about a lot is just you know our our appreciation of music communities uh, whether that's on a diy level whether it's in the kind of chamber music classical realm we also deal with and um and that's the exciting part of doing that, you know. Mm-hmm. Guillermo, any thoughts about about um, community event and embo- art as community event and embodiment? Yeah, aside from uh, what Raven is saying, that we have to work with a lot of different musicians and a, dif- a lot of different people as composers, I like uh, the idea um, of um, not centralizing the, the the performance in a in a in a proscenium in a classical uh, sense, uh, which is a very vertical relationship with the audience. And uh, I realized that I like to perform at the level of the people and, and incorporate the people as performers mm-hmm. and participants and witnesses of what is happening. Uh, I think that's very important for me, decentralizing. Uh, for example, in the quartet, no, the, the quartet is very important and all the eyes should be in the quartet, but in my quartet, the eyes and the ears are di- diverted. They are not centered exactly in the quartet. The, par- the quartet is just a, a part of the whole thing. Yeah, It's cool. very decentralized and horizontal relationships. I'm very interested in horizontal relationships. And I think it's very much needed these days in this world to yeah. stop the patriarchal vertical up to down relationship with things and i think that yeah i think that can extend the scores too that's something guillermo and i both have you know and and there's other composers working on this where that a score might include an opportunity for non-musicians or or people who don't consider themselves to be trained musicians or anybody that would have anything to do with making a score that invites anybody to perform these you know and and taking away that that idea that there's this um you know, you had to go through a conservatory and read no, dots on paper to understand how the music is made. I think I think Guillermo and I both have this belief that the score can contain that invitation for anybody to engage with and, and perform the work with anybody else. It's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I like it how you, um, the, the, the thought that maybe visual art has come to this communal idea a little bit late. It's always been there in music, right? Um, um, just a follow-up question from from uh, folks uh, from from I guess folks from the audience. Um, two questions: How else do you enact? How else do you enact horizontal relationships in art? And then another another um, in, in exhibitions and in performance and in public art. What kinds of decisions do you make to enact this horizontality? So I guess just a general question about how one can enact horizontality in. In, in art and how, how you two might do that or think of doing that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I guess I answered it in the last one. For me, it is to compose some pieces that encourage anyone to, to be able to perform. And either that's because it's an action, a, a sonic action that anybody can do, uh, you know, with a simple prompt, or it's it's something where there is an opportunity to collaborate with somebody who might have a skill set. You know, somebody who doesn't consider themselves a musician to be uh, in in duet with somebody who is a trained violinist or something. So, um, you know, maybe maybe demystifying 
you know, that kind of element of the score. There's also a, I mean, I, I, I'm not somebody who writes complex notated music necessarily, but sometimes the complexity is there to bring everybody to the same level in that they can't play it together. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, everybody's going to have a hard time playing it. It doesn't matter if you can read this, you know, these uh, 64th notes and this crazy meter or whatever. It, it's just, it's going to be hard no matter what. So there's been opportunity, there's been things like that uh, as an example of, of putting everybody on the same field, you know, so to speak. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yes, I, I, I believe that also, um, in, in my case, also uh, opening space in a score for anything to happen and not controlling everything completely, but letting spontaneity to happen within certain limits is very important. To, ha- to, 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 to have some openness in the parameters that we're controlling in the sound or, or in, the, in the score to give it certain freedom, no? And I would put like the very basic example of uh, jazz charts, no? You have the melody and you have the chords, but you're able to do certain number of things that are uh, allowed to do that and give you certain freedom in each measure. Mm-hmm. But uh, you can ext- expand that as open or as close as you want. Uh, uh, opening space for randomness, for spontaneity. Yeah. A um, couple more questions from uh, from from the folks here. One, um, using technologies of surveillance, are you ever concerned about compounding the violence of these tools, even while meaning to protest them, especially in using them communally or in the public? How do you negotiate this balance in creating the works? Well, um, you know, when we were installing one of when we're installing the piece at Documenta, the uh, LRAD piece, we were one of the LRADs was on top of the music conservatory, and the other one was on top of the Hellenic Armed Services Armed Forces Banquet Hall, uh, which is where the police and the military have their their dinners. And we noticed one day as we were installing, they were checking out our LRAD, you know, <laughs> curious about it. So we were, we had this fear that we might not get it back or that they might go and buy some of these things. <laughs> and I'm sure LRAD Corporation would have no problem selling them some. Um, but it's always a worry. I mean, that's what intrigues me about Guillermo's remote control pieces because it uses, you know, it uses the phone, right? And we, we have this... Um, connection to this thing that of course is probably staring at us and measuring us and uh, you know uh, taking into account all of our interests and so it is the it is the eye in the sky on us and so i don't know i you know i i I, the fear is already there that we are being watched and that we are of course uh, maybe unable to escape escape that even as we promote this thing that we're on the zoom i mean i don't know what's looking at us as we log into zoom right so um it, it's always a concern at least you know to to think about how to counter that you know how to how to not only disengage from that but maybe to see what other kinds of ways we can we can get around that and and maybe it goes back to this shared experience we're talking about of collaboration of community collaboration if for no other reason than to just realize we're in the same boat and you know maybe can find ourselves out of that um but yeah i don't i don't know i mean i don't i don't i'm uh, those are the materials sometimes that we have to use and and at best we can use them as critique I will bring the the idea of uh, reverse anthropology and the early um, artist in Brazil that regurgitated everything that was Western and using the same tools, turn it into something else, something Brazilian, something Latin American. And those are the instruments that they op- that they infringe upon us. So that's or that's going to be the instruments that you that we turn around against them, not against them, but we give our own interpretation to those cybernetic instruments, the phone, the drones, whatever, you know. I mean, they are there, you know. We can use them to in any way we want. I see that in both of your work, right? Um, uh, Both of your practices, 
really trying to think about the 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 undiscovered potentialities of, of these things, right? What's in this thing that could be used in a different way, right? How, how could this be turned otherwise, used otherwise? Yeah. Maybe one last question here, and then I'll turn it over to um, Karen Quoney. Um, the uh, a question here, uh, what are you working on now? And are there other artists working with sound um, and around these issues whose work you admire? You admire sound or? Uh, yeah, so I guess it's two questions. One, what are you working on now? Um, what, what projects are you working on now? And also, are there other artists working with sound kind of along the, with the issues that we've been talking about today? Are there other artists you admire that you'd, you'd, you'd recommend to, to folks? Yeah. Uh, you go, Raven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one artist that comes to mind, uh, Lawrence Abu Hamden is doing a lot of work um, thinking about yeah about uh, you know surveillance thinking about the the um the kind of uh the artifacts of of hearing this kind of other kind of deep listening that that might be happening out there um and the kind of um maybe forensics around that as well it's, it's very interesting um i'm sure others come to mind there's been there's been some other composers and sound artists who've worked with lrads and and this kind of more sonic weaponry i think um, also, maybe exploring more, like just how that can be used in a public space as well. I, I'm really excited that um, that might be an ongoing tool, you know, an, an instrument. Um, and what I'm working on now, uh, I, I do have a piece coming up in the next Whitney Biennial that is another one of these field recordings that I was able to uh, gather from Standing Rock. And this one is a, a bit of a silent protest, an instance of silence, but with this, this energy around that. And I'll, I'll, um, I'll leave it at that if, if you're able to uh, experience that piece. Cool. Guillermo, anything? Yes, reinterpretation of language, reinterpretation of data into sound, uh, animal communication versus human communication, phonetics, uh, masking of of voices uh, in order to uh, to hide um, identities, uh, <laughs> uh, sonic poetry, sonic poetry where sonic poetry meets uh, music, or where uh, phonetics meet music as a way of expression. Um, yeah, things like that. <laughs> cool. Um, well, thank you both so much. It's been such a pleasure talking with you. Um, and I want to turn it over to Karen to, um, to to close us and carry us out. Thank you indeed very much. Uh, my name is Karen Coney. I'm the Senior Director and Chief Curator of the New School's Vera List Center for Art and Politics, a platform for public scholarship on art and politics. We are the co-sponsors of this symposium and are particularly excited to do so in connection with our two-year research focus theme on protocols of engagement. Thank you again, Christoph, Guillermo and Raven for this mesmerizing conversation that provides such a crucial framework for understanding the embodied and acoustic experience of life under drone warfare. Thanks to all of the co-presenters and colleagues who've made this series possible. Thank you to the members of the High Line Plinth Committee, contemporary art leaders committed to realizing major commissions and engaging in the public success of the Plinth who make this series possible. The Verlis Center's participation in remote control is supported in part by the and Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, the Ford Foundation and the Kettering Fund, as well as the members of the Verlis Center Board and the New School. And thank you, everyone who attended today's event. To dive in for our next uh, conversation this series, please join us tomorrow, Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the second event in our symposium entitled Imaging War, Drones from the Ground. It will feature artists Haria Wahid, Aziz Hazara, as well as Saks Afridi and Ali Reis, and is moderated by writer and curator Muheb Esmat. The conversation will explore depictions of drone warfare in Western and American media 
and how they diverge widely, sometimes diametrically, from the imagery used by artists to describe life under drone warfare, creating a stark duality of image experience. To learn more about the following events in the series throughout the fall and to sign up for the newsletter, visit Highline Art website. And um, I think there's a link for that in the chat. Thank you again and see you tomorrow.